Welcome to Odyssey. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Since 9-11, he has trained over 1,500 counterterrorism and intelligence officers from more than 50 nations, including Iraq and Afghanistan, and has advised the US and NATO militaries at the three-star level. Sebastian's father was a political prisoner under the con communist system in Hungary from 1950 to 1956 and escaped to the UK where Sebastian was born and raised. This background taught him the value of freedom as well as its value to people around the world who desire freedom. He now is a citizen of this country, an American by choice, and he believes deeply in what America stands for. Sebastian, as a professor of counterterrorism and counterinsurgency, spends most of his time teaching our special forces on how to understand the enemy we face today, like Al-Qaeda, and how to defeat them. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Thank you, Congressman. Wow, this is dangerous. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, that's one that my father would have been proud of and my mother would have believed. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real pleasure and honor to speak here before you tonight, especially uh, such a, a large crowd. Um, what I'd like to start off by doing, because I like to get the unpleasant tree out of the way first, is to show you one slide that I'm required to read to you. Okay. Can you read it? It's very small type. Okay. The things you're about to hear for the next 40 minutes do not necessarily represent the views of the Department of Defense or any other US government agency. Hopefully in the future they might. Okay, that's, that's getting the legal stuff out of the way. Um, I had a wonderful dinner before I uh, came up to the podium, and one of my gracious hosts was telling me about how she was very interested in having me give more than one speech when I uh, traveled here with my wife, Katie, from uh, Washington, so that we could make best use of our visit to go somewhere else to speak. And this uh, lady said she'd gone to her club to talk to them about what I do, or what I speak about. And the instant response from the people at that club that shall go unnamed was, oh no, that's far too frightening. <laughs> yes, it is. I am not here to give you a joyous, optimistic vision of the current state of affairs in the world today. If you expected that, you're at the wrong function. I'm going to tell you, from the point of view of a national security analyst and professor, what is going on and why it should scare you, and what we should do in response to keep this nation safe. I don't know about you, but certain events in history are etched indelibly on one's life. The assassination of John F. Kennedy is, of course, one of them. Everybody knows where they were on that day. For me, the event that changed my life was that sunny Tuesday morning in Manhattan, 12 years ago. I was sitting in a cafe in Budapest, preparing my class notes for a lecture I was going to give the next day at a university there in the Hungarian capital. And I got a phone call from the uh, the Minister for Secret Services, who um, said, you need to go and switch on a television. My wife and I didn't have cable at home, so we rushed to a friend's house, uh, an American diplomat, and switched on CNN. And of course, you know what we saw. The peerless blue skies above New York, shattered by a fireball and a smoke cloud, which depicted the most deadly terrorist attack in modern history. And this is something that just has to be empirically remembered. I was in a unit in the British Military Intelligence Reserves that 
dealt with or tried to deal with the Irish Republican Army, the biggest terrorist threat to the United Kingdom during the Cold War. And what I remind people is the IRA was one of the most successful terrorist organizations of the 20th century. And in the 30 years of its activities between 1968 and the Good Friday Peace Accords of 1998, the IRA killed less than 2,500 people in 30 years. Al-Qaeda killed more people in one morning. And we need to remember that. Why? Because the results of that attack in Pennsylvania, in Shanksfield, in Manhattan and in Washington, resulted in what is today the longest ever military campaign the United States has ever been engaged in since 1776. Longer than World War I, longer than World War II, longer than even the Vietnam conflict. And we're still fighting it. But the obvious question is, since we've killed bin Laden, and since we've left Iraq, and it sounds as if the commander-in-chief has decided we will leave Afghanistan next year, the natural question is, have we won? Are we now safe? My answer to that question is a very adamant no. Because this threat is not about one man, it's about an ideology. And the best way to understand Al-Qaeda is to understand how that ideology developed and where it came from. It's not a function of September the 11th. It's not even a product of the first World Trade Center attacks of 1993. It is a much older, much more deeply rooted, historically founded ideology. If I have the time, we could go back this evening to the 6th century, to the 7th century, talk about what happened on the Arabian Peninsula during the time of Muhammad, but we don't have that luxury. So let me just talk about three or four key events in recent history, in the 20th century, that are quintessential to our understanding of the threat America faces today. It is often um, easy for the mainstream media to ridicule and make fun of the pronouncements bin Laden made about his goal to reestablish an Islamic caliphate a theocratic empire of Islam. And that is what his successor, Ayman al-Zawahri, the Egyptian doctor who now heads al-Qaeda, says is their reason for existing, to create an Islamic empire that is the caliphate. Very easy to make fun of, some crazy guy in a cave, right? Nothing to take seriously. But the fact is, if you open a history book, you realize something very quickly. The caliphate isn't some pipe dream of some fringe individual. The Islamic Empire of Islam existed for over 1,100 years with its headquarters variously in Mecca, in Damascus, or in Baghdad. But 100 years ago, the Islamic Empire of Islam still existed as the caliphate. We in the West did not call it the caliphate. We, of course, called it the Ottoman Empire. But the Ottoman Empire was the Islamic empire, theocratic empire of Islam. However, in 1914, that entity, the Ottoman Empire, put its money on the wrong horse. It decided to side with the Austro-Hungarian Empire against the Western nations that fought World War I. As a result, it was on the wrong side of that fight come 1918. And it faced a catastrophe. It saw the Austrian Empire being taken apart piece by piece, and it didn't wish to share that fate. As a result, as all of you who know your Turkish history are aware, a young Ottoman officer named Mustafa Kemal decided to reinvent his country to save the Ottoman Empire from the fate that befell the Austro-Hungarian losers of World War I. As a result, he decided to rebrand his nation, to convince the victors of World War I that they, the Ottomans, are just as Western as they are and should be let into their club. That individual, after he renamed himself Kemal Mustafa Atatürk, 
a very modest name that means father of all Turks, <laughs> became president Atatürk of the new Turkish Republic. And it wasn't just a name change. It wasn't just changing the letterhead on the governmental paper. Because he said to the West, I'm not the head of an empire. I'm now the head of a secular republic. And I will follow the guidance of your American founding fathers. And I will separate religion from politics, just as we did in our Constitution. To make sure we believed him, and this is the first moment that is important for understanding Al-Qaeda, in 1924, Kemal Mustafa Atatürk, a man who called himself a Muslim, with his own pen, with his own hand, signed an official declaration that formally dissolved the Islamic empire that was the caliphate. The president of Turkey dissolved the empire of Islam and gave the caliph who existed, the emperor, his W-2, sent him into retirement. Now, you don't have to be a fringe extremist. You don't have to be a violent jihadi. You can be just average Joe Muhammad walking down the street into Damascus or Cairo, and that can really, really anger you. But somebody who says he's a Muslim has just dissolved something that has existed for more than a millennia. That is the spark. That's the beginning. How do we know? Well, lo and behold, less than five years later in Cairo, a man call, called Hassan al-Banna does something in response to Atatürk's dissolution. He creates something called the Ikhwan Muslimin, which we know as the Muslim Brotherhood. In 1928, less than five years after that monumental decision, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood is founded with one mission, to undo that which was unjustly done by Atatürk, to recreate the, the Islamic Empire of Islam, to reestablish the caliphate. If you don't believe me, go to that highly classified secretive database called Google, and Google Muslim Brotherhood founding charter in English, and you will see quite clearly the statement of why they exist. To this day, from 1928 to 2013. And the fact that this should disturb you is linked to the recent events in the Middle East and North Africa. Because after this so-called Arab Spring, who won all the elections from Tunisia to Cairo? Exactly the same organization, the Ikhwan Muslimin, the Muslim Brotherhood, that is predicated on re-establishing the theocratic empire of Islam. But we'll re return to those in a moment. Other events are important. The creation of Israel after World War II is also a slap in the face to many Muslims. Why? Have you ever asked yourself why there is a beautiful golden dome a mosque in the center of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is important, of course, to Jews and Christians. But why is there an Islamic place of worship smack dab in the middle of Jerusalem? Well, because Islam holds that the prophet Muhammad, God's last and final prophet, ascended into heaven from the rock upon which that mosque is built. That is why that whole territory is considered to be sacred trust territory for Islam. The direction of prayer, most people don't know, the Qibla, the direction of prayer for Muslims, which today is Mecca, was, for the first decades of Islam, in fact, Jerusalem, not Mecca. And that is why the creation of Israel after World War II was, like the dissolution of the Caliphate, a monumental, stunning blow to the psyche of the Islamic world that would call for some kind of response. And that response would come in 1979. The most important year to understand the threat we face today is not September the 11th, is not the first World, world Trade Center attack, it's 1979, for three reasons. Of course, the first one is the Iranian Revolution, which is a Persian thing and a Shia thing, but nevertheless has great 
um, resonance for all Muslims. Why? What is the message of the Iranian Revolution from 1979 to this current day? Who's the boss? The little short man in the cheap suits? It's not Ahmadinejad who's the boss in Tehran. It is, of course, and always has been, the Ayatollah and the Supreme Council. And those gentlemen do not wear Western suits. They wear the clerical garb of the holy man. And that is why the Iranian Revolution is a revolution of theocratic politics, reintegrating Islam into the political entity that is the Iranian Republic today. It's a message to Sunnis as much as it is to Shia. Second reason is, of course, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. In 1979, a heathen, godless Western nation, without provocation, invades a Muslim land. And that requires what? Of course, that requires jihad. That requires the fellow co-religionists of the Afghans to come and fight for their oppressed Muslim brothers in Central Asia. And who was one of the men who volunteered? Osama bin Laden. Became one of the so-called Arab Mujahid, <coughs> the non-Afghan holy warriors. This is when modern jihad is born in 1979. The last event is one that is less well known. In fact, most people have never heard of it. Whilst the Soviets are getting embroiled in their own Vietnam, whilst we are desperately trying to work out how to rescue our hostages in Tehran, something far more important is happening on the Arabian Peninsula. On New Year's Day, of the Arabian calendar, which is different from our Gregorian calendar. On the New Year's Day, 300 armed fanatics with automatic weapons stormed into the grand square in front of the great mosque of Mecca and opened fire, ripped the microphone out of the hand of the imam of the holiest mosque in the Islamic world and declared holy war. Who were these individuals? They were young Arabs, young Saudis, Yemenis, who had decided that Islam had lost its way because Muslims were weak, had fallen from the true path. And the only way to get Islam back to its greatness was to instigate a holy war. A holy war not just against the infidel, but against people like the king of Saudi Arabia who was deemed to be a bad Muslim, a fake Muslim, a pharaoh, if you will. It is the consequences of their assault in which they controlled the mosque of Mecca for 15 days. Incredible. A bunch of 300 guys in flip-flops with rusty Kalashnikovs holding the holiest site in Mecca, in Islam. The important consequence is what the king did, because the king found out that these weren't just a bunch of ragtag young <laughs> reprobates. They had been encouraged and in fact blessed in their terrorist attack by a group of Saudi clerics, citizens of Saudi Arabia who were holy men, agreed with these young fanatics and said, yes, the king, he's a fake Muslim. We need violence. We must purge the system and get back to greatness. And the king, finding out who these individuals were, invited them to the palace. This is in a wonderful book called The Siege of Mecca by the Wall Street Journal journalist Trofimov. The king says to the priests or the clerics, I know who you are and I know your connection to the jihadists. If you guarantee for me that this ideology of holy war will never threaten me, the family, the House of Saud, or the government of Saudi Arabia ever again, I will make you, your sons, and your grandsons, the court ulema, the priestly caste to the king. Unfortunately for us, and for the Muslim world, those clerics said yes. And they signed a secret deal. But the really important aspect of that deal was one small codicil, a footnote, that stated, whilst the propagation and encouragement of holy war within Saudi Arabia and Muslim lands is haram, is forbidden, its propagation and export to non-Muslim territories is not only permissible, it will be supported by the government of Saudi Arabia. 
So jihad here, bad. Jihad in Christian lands, in Buddhist lands, in Jewish lands, that's absolutely fine. How do we know this? There's a wonderful piece of empirical evidence that, that I like to quote. Until recently, the most, there are numerous translations of the Quran. And you can't really mess with the text of the Quran too much. What changes between different versions are the explanatory footnotes, how things are interpreted in the footnotes that aren't written by Allah, of course. Until recently, the most widely available English language Quran in US federal penitentiaries had footnotes explaining the Quran and saying that Jews and Christians are pigs and donkeys and that all Muslims should acquire weapons of mass destruction to kill the infidel. That version of the Quran, and I have a copy of it, if you open the back cover, which is of course the front, the first thing you see on page one is the great seal of the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia and underneath in English, for anyone to read, it states, printed and distributed by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. That was the most widely available Quran in American prisons until somebody in the FBI decided to read the footnotes. The last events are obvious. In 1989, what happens in Afghanistan? The Soviets surrender. They've had enough. They've had their Vietnam and they decide to go home. If you're Bin Laden sitting on a mountain top with your binoculars, looking at that last convoy of Russian soldiers leaving Afghanistan, who do you think won that war against the heathen infidel? Not the two million Afghans that were napalmed by the Soviet forces, but me, the Mujahideen that I created, that I trained. I've defeated a superpower. And of course, what happened to that superpower two years later? in 1991, on Christmas Day, the best Christmas present I ever received. It ceased to be. It dissolved itself. So from a point of view of Bin Laden, not only have I militarily defeated a superpower, I have caused its destruction. And who's left? How many other superpowers are there? Only one, and it's us. And as a result, Bin Laden decides that we are the next target. And after the Gulf War, in which we, as heathen, infidel nation, were allowed to place our troops on the soil of Saudi Arabia, after that insult to Bin Laden, that is when Al-Qaeda was truly born. And of course, when was the first attack on New York? Less than two years after the Gulf War. So the ideology that drives Al-Qaeda is an old ideology. It goes back to key moments in the 20th century history of the Arab world and Islam. And the fact is, the ideological nature of the enemy is not something that we can honestly talk about today. In September of 2011, the White House issued a directive to the effect that all, and I do mean all, counterterrorism training executed by the Pentagon or the Department of Justice, to include the FBI, must be reviewed. Anything that discusses religion must be purged, and any briefer or instructor who uses words such as jihad or Islamic terrorism must be banned from instructing in the future. This is called the so-called purge. My wife, uh, Katie, has written much about it, and it is available on the internet. As a result, today, you have to be a very brave man to talk about the ideology that drives the enemy we face today in front of those people who are supposed to protect this nation, be they FBI agents, special forces officers, or anybody who wears a uniform or is sworn to protect America. This is a real problem because you cannot kill an ideology in the way we think you can kill it today. It's quite stunning 
that drones, the use of drones to kill members of Al-Qaeda, whilst an act greatly criticized when President Bush was the commander-in-chief, has today increased enormously under the current administration. And in fact, we think that the more people we can target with drones, the safer we will be. My response to that is the following. You may even be able to locate an important leader of Al-Qaeda or the Taliban in the Tora Bora Mountains. You may be able to get a drone to him, and you may be able to kill him cleanly, clinically. But after you kill him, if 15 people that he knows volunteer to replace him, what have you turned that drone into? A recruiting vehicle for the enemy. It's Vietnam all over again. It's body bags. It's a very, very bad metric for measuring victory. The fact is, the enemy we face today is what I call a form of hybrid totalitarianism. It is a totalitarian ideology. It is absolutist. It is them or us. They are committed to killing us or converting us. And that's what makes it totalitarian. But it's hybrid because it, unlike communism, unlike fascism, it uses religious arguments to justify the violence that it executes. And as a result, it's very difficult for us to deal with it because it's different from the Soviet Union. It's different from Hitler's Third Reich. One of the ways that it's very difficult for us to respond is a function of a gross misunderstanding and misinterpretation of what the Founding Fathers meant by separation of church and state. When the Founding Fathers wrote the Disestablishment Clause that created separation of church and state, and I find it quite amusing that an immigrant has to explain this to national security professionals, they only meant two things. America cannot have a state-sanctioned religion, nor can the state persecute anybody because they are of the lot wrong religion. That's all it means. Separation of church and state does not mean religion does not form policy, or you can't talk about the Ten Commandments when you're at your desk. It means there's no state religion, and no one faith community can be disenfranchised because of who they are. That's all it means. It does not mean, as one FBI agent told me, and this is the true story. After a lecture I gave, an FBI agent came up to me and said, I was tracking, I was following, I had ears on and eyes on, which is the slang for I was videoing, I was watching and surveilling with a bug an Al-Qaeda bad guy in America. I was tracking him. And I saw the direction he was taking, and it led him to a mosque. And at the moment that he realized this Al-Qaeda individual was walking into a mosque, this agent said, I was in a crisis. Because I knew that if I told my superiors where he's going, that management level official, because he doesn't understand what separation of church and state means, would tell me to switch off the microphones and the video camera. Because that's what he thinks separation of church and state is. The fact is, it doesn't matter whether that, whether that individual is going to a church, a Jewish temple, or a mosque. If they're a terrorist, I hope you would agree with me, you would want that FBI agent to know what they are doing inside that building. As we've seen in Iraq, the insurgents in Iraq made great use of mosques as ammunition dumps and recruiting centers. That's the, face, the nature of the threat we face today. So, where does that leave us? Well, my wife and I, we're, we're both children of the Cold War. I personally miss it immensely. <laughs> it's very simple, right? You knew who the enemy was and where they were. They had a street address. But one thing we forget too, too quickly about the Cold War is that it, too, was an ideological conflict. 
It might have been frightening because they had 25,000 nuclear warheads, we had 25,000 nuclear warheads, you know, that my parents told me about how they were stockpiling cans of beans during the Cuban Missile cri Crisis just in case Khrushchev got an itchy trigger finger. Yeah, that was all very frightening. But on November the 9th, 1989, how did it all end? How many shots were fired across Checkpoint Charlie in Berlin? How many weapons were discharged in Moscow or along the Iron Curtain on that momentous day in November? None. So how did we win? We won ideologically. We won by undermining the legitimacy of the foe we faced, by making communism visible for what it was, a sham that didn't guarantee anything to anybody unless they were members of the Politburo. We won it as a result of political and ideological warfare, words that are dirty words today in Washington. But we decided to collect the greatest names during those momentous years in the 1980s that had actually executed the ideological warfare from the White House that helped to make the Soviet Union crumble. We brought them together in a room with those individuals who today best understand the ideology of the jihadists, those individuals who are responsible for September the 11th and those people in the Muslim Brotherhood that wished to recreate the caliphate. And we locked them away in a room for two days, and we said to them, you've destroyed an ideological foe. You understand the current one we face. Together, sit down and work it out how to defeat the current threat America faces. Because it is very much alive and well. Let me uh, give you a few closing thoughts if I convince you of one thing and one thing alone, it should be the, the visual I have up here. The fact is that since September the 11th, as a nation, especially the national security elements of the government, have focused almost exclusively on this, on defeating violent jihadists such as Al-Qaeda, such as Al-Shabaab, such as Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, that is, of course, so interestingly reasserting itself as we speak. We want to do what? Prevent these individuals from executing another September the 11th. Blowing people up. Putting SUVs full of explosives into Times Square. Shooting military officers in Fort Hood. That's what we want to stop. But what we forget, or what we don't focus on adequately, is that there's another group of individuals up here that can be labeled the non-violent jihadists. And these individuals, especially the Muslim Brotherhood, outnumber the former group by multiples, by factors, thousands more than Al-Qaeda. And these individuals, whilst they may argue amongst themselves, must be understood for what they are, linked at the strategic level. Why? Because they both wish to realize the same objective. Whether you're a terrorist or whether you're President Morsi of Egypt, you are both committed to creating theocratic regimes across the world that will unite together as a global caliphate. Let me just share with you one recent quote from the Arab world that never ever made it, strangely enough, onto the pages of the New York Times or Washington Post. The Brotherhood is a very slippery organization. It has to be to have survived for as long as it has. And the Brotherhood always has two faces. There's always a political frontman, such as Morsi, the president of, of uh, Egypt, 
But he's really a nobody. Mursi is just a puppet for the brotherhood. The brotherhood always has at the same time another individual who is much more important. And that individual is called the supreme guide of the brotherhood. Currently, that rank is held by an individual called Mohammed Badi. And Mohammed Badi gave an interview in an Arab newspaper three weeks before the Cairo parliamentary elections that resulted from the Arab Spring. So Mubarak has been removed. We're all waiting for Jeffersonian democracy to you know, explode out of the Middle East. And the supreme guide of the Muslim Brotherhood gives an interview in Arabic to a local newspaper. And the interview has two quite shocking sentences. Number one, the caliphate is now possible. The caliphate is now imminent. The religious theocratic empire of Islam is now possible, thanks to the Arab Spring, and it's just around the corner. And of course, three weeks later, who won the elections? The Muslim Brotherhood. This is the reality in the world today, and many people are not allowed to talk about it honestly. So, what does that all mean? I grew up in Europe, but I learned something about my fellow Americans very quickly. You can be the smartest guy, you can have as many PhDs as you like, but all we Americans care about is what does it really mean? What difference does it make to me? How does it change my life? And what is the answer to the so what question? Today, the answer to the so-called question is that everybody has a role to play. Not just the Green Berets I teach in Fort Bragg or the FBI agents I teach in Quantico. Everybody in this room and every American that loves this country has a role to play. And that role is to educate, educate, and educate. Educate yourselves and educate your friends and your family. Make people understand this is not about freedom of religion. It's about the US Constitution and people who would wish to destroy America. Re what I, am, I would also provide as resources after we locked those gentlemen away for two days in that room, we decided to publish their findings. This is from my wife's organization, the Westminster Institute. And it is, left-hand side, the people in the White House that ran the counter-ideological warfare during the Cold War. People on the right, those individuals who understand jihadism today and their conclu conclusions for how to defeat the enemy. Additionally, if you're already working, and some of you I think are forward thinkers, if you're already working on your Christmas Amazon.com list, then there's only one book you should buy on understanding the world today, and that's by Patrick Sukdeo, and it's called Global Jihad. And I think Global Jihad is really the name of the game. It's the, the name of the enemy we face. The first appendix, the appendix, is worth the $14 for the price of the whole book. OK, I've blathered enough. I've left uh, also copies for you who want to dig a little deeper. I testified before Congress on the anniversary of 9-11. I've left copies of the testimony up front, and also another article I wrote on the strategy of Al Qaeda and the events I discussed uh, earlier in a little bit more detail. For those who'd like to delve a little deeper, please help yourselves. But otherwise, um, thank you, and I'd be glad to take any questions. Yes. It's naive, but if a country elects the Arab Brotherhood, uh, excuse me, the Muslim Brotherhood, yes. and the majority of the people vote for that, how does one get around that process um, legitimately? Uh, I don't think it's our job to get around that process. Uh, it's our job to think twice about selling them F 16s. Right? That's our job. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong. 
Um, I don't like dictatorships. I would not be alive today, I would not be standing here unless somebody had liberated my father from a communist prison in 1956. So don't get me wrong. But that doesn't mean we have to gallivant around the world trying to impose our form of uh, politics upon other countries. Why? What happened in 1776 in this great nation? The founding fathers were geniuses, but they didn't start this country with a blank sheet of paper or, you know, out of whole cloth. What, why were the founding fathers so successful in creating the world's first democracy? Because they brought with them all the lessons of the last thousand years of the Europeans screwing it up, right? Whether it's lack of religious freedom, empires, whatever you want, they knew how not to do it. And that's what they brought to the table in 1776. Who has that knowledge in Egypt? When was Egypt last a democracy? It's a trick question. It's a trick question. Never. In 5,000 years, from the pharaohs until the recent election, it has never, ever functioned as a democracy. So the idea that we can just waltz in there, sprinkle some money around, or send some advisors is insane. Democracy is not about constitutions and political parties and free press. Those are just the, the symptoms of democracy. Democracy is about political culture, the unwritten rules of what is permissible and what is not permissible. So uh, for me, the answer is not how do we create democracies. The, the question is how do we, as best we can, ensure our national interests? And the idea that we sell F-16s to an organization whose supreme leader has just said the caliphate is just around the corner is not a good way to ensure the national interests of the American nation. But, but, but there are other ways, and, and there are... Don't get me wrong, this isn't about being bellicose and you know, waving a, a, a big stick around either. Something we don't talk about in Egypt is the fact that, uh, apart from the economy right now in Egypt, which stinks, one of the biggest problems in Egypt is female mut uh, genital mutilation yeah? as a result of Islamic practice. In fact, actually, Arab practice is not really Islamic, it's Arab practice. But the idea that if you genitally mutilate a young girl, she will not be unfaithful to you because she will not have pleasure from sex. Right? This, this, is, this is what happens across a lot of Africa, and, and it's an incredibly large problem we don't talk about in Egypt, especially rural Egypt. And one of the things I say to you know, liberal individuals I have to argue with or be on panels with is, you know what, either removing a woman's clitoris against their will is wrong everywhere, or it really doesn't matter, right? Either it's a human right that you don't do this to 14-year-old girls, or you say, oh, that's, that's an Arab thing, they can do that. If we believe in universal human rights, which is not language conservatives often use, but they should, then we should say to President Morsi, you know what? Our next three billion dollar military aid grant to Egypt, we're not going to sign that check unless you start dealing with the rights of women in your country. You're not, you're not imposing anything. I'm not invading Egypt, right? I'm not doing an Iraq or an Afghanistan, but I'm saying, you know what? You want to be my buddy? There are costs to being my buddy. And one of them is you know, equal rights for women. So that's where I see you. Know, you've got to play hardball, because this is what the Muslim Brotherhood understands. You've got to use all tools, not just the military. You've got to use diplomacy and talking hard talk behind closed doors. And I just don't see it. I mean, I can show you a photograph on another slide that literally, as, as um, Mohammed Badi was giving that interview about the caliphate being imminent, I can show you a photograph that was taken at the same time of him shaking hands with our most senior diplomat in America, with Hillary Clinton. Her giving face time to that man who says the caliphate is imminent. We don't need to do that. There are lots of people in Egypt who we should be giving face time to, who are actually a lot more Jeffersonian than the Muslim Brotherhood are. 
And those are the kinds of things. We need imagination, and we need to be, how shall I say this without being uh, rude, we need to have a backbone in all of our relations in that part of the world. Because you can wake up one morning, really, I mean, this is what my father taught me, uh, his experience in prison. You can wake up one morning and realize you've lost the war and not a shot has been fired. Don't take my word for it, but Google it when you leave here. Two years ago, a New Jersey federal judge brought down a decision that a Muslim American man must not be prosecuted or punished for beating his wife because that's his religious culture. Nobody got shot, nothing blew up, right? There's no IEDs exploding. But did that decision take a chunk out of the constitution of this, uh, this nation? Absolutely. That's political and legal warfare. Yeah? So, you know, Ronald Reagan said it best. The loss of liberty is always just one generation away. Just one generation. That's all it takes. Whether it's Hungary in 1948, whether it's Austria in 1948 uh, or 38, it doesn't matter. You can wake up one day and it's all over. More questions? First one's always the hardest. Second, go ahead, please. Oh, we have, we have a microphone, I think. Can you talk a little bit about the American press today? I feel that we no longer... <laughs> Do I have to? Well, I feel we no longer have a free press. I mean, you look at all of the things that happen, and very few stations even cover it or talk about it, it's like it doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, what, what, what do I think about the, the, the press today in America and, and whether or not, not we have a free press? You know, I, I, I have an iconoclastic uh, attitude to, to the press. Journalists, nine out of 10 times, are gonna be liberals. It's just the nature of the business, yeah? It's like nine out of 10 CEOs are gonna be conservatives. It's just a fact of life, yeah? Horses for courses, as we say. So the idea that there's this monumental, you know, left bias that is conspiratorial, you know, that, that every Monday morning the New York Times sits down with a cabal with the CNNBC and, and the Washington Post, no. These are the kind, you know, idealists get into, naive idealists get into the media business. We have to reconcile ourselves with that fact and deal with it. And we have to understand one thing, and I think the recent elections demonstrated this. This is, this is a kind of meta level. It is no longer adequate, it never has been fully adequate, but it is especially so today. It is no longer adequate for us, if, if you are, Okay, I, I will say I am a conservative, okay? It is no longer adequate for people like me to argue a case on its merits. This is what conservatives, especially in Washington, do not understand. You can write as many statistical economic analyses of an issue, whether it's Obamacare or the deficit, the facts do not win today. You have to have the facts on your side but the way you're going to win is to appeal to emotion. It's just a fact. Yeah? I, th I think you know, the recent election showed this. That you can win if you have... Com if, uh, I'll tell you an anecdote. A friend of mine, a conservative, is a hiker. He, all, he goes off hiking all the time with other fellow conservatives. And he told me that just before the elections, he was hiking in the woods of Northern Virginia, and he was talking to a young woman who said she's a conservative, and she told him, I've done the math, and I've looked at the Republican candidate's policies, and I've looked at the president's policies, and I've worked out that personally, as an individual, I will be financially better off if I vote for Romney. Personally, factually, I will be better off. But then she said, as a conservative, I just can't 
vote for him. I'm going to vote for Obama because Romney's declared war on women. Based on what? Based on fluff. Based on narrative. Based on repeating something enough times so people believe it. That's what we have to understand has to be dealt with. How do you maintain your principles, have the facts on your side, but pluck the emotional heartstrings of the voter? Because that's what politics has become. And I saw this very clearly in the UK. In the last 30 years, 25, 30 years, politics has become about who can sell more washing up liquid. That's what it is. Who has the nicest tie? Who has the whitest grin? Yeah? It's, it, packaging has, has overtaken content. Yeah? And the problem I have with, with, with the current debate amongst conservatives is, you know what, we need to learn what they do, and we have to do it to the detriment of our principles. Well, then you're not a conservative anymore. Either you're fighting for it because you believe in it, and you have to learn how to package it, or don't get involved in politics, because then you're just a guy who's selling washing up liquid. Yeah. But that's a lot, that has a lot to do with the way media has evolved in, in recent age. Um, the other point is, and it comes, most of the problems we face today come down to one word, whether it's you know, AIDS in Africa, global warming, or Al-Qaeda. They all come down to one word that begins with L, leadership. Most of our problems, even the deficit, could be solved if people had some gumption and some leadership. To be a statesman, 60 years ago, like Adenauer, Churchill, and de Gaulle, meant what? Meant that I had a vision of my nation 50 or 100 years from now. And I was prepared to take the time to convince my electorate that, you know what, to be in that better place, it's going to take some painful things right now. You're going to have to pull in your belt. You're going to have to, you know, not have that second slice of carrot cake. It was a great carrot cake, but, you know, I was tempted to have a second slice tonight, but you can't have that second slice of carrot cake. That's what leadership meant. Who on earth does that today, in any country, says, uh, you know what, you've got to endure pain for five years to have your grandchildren safe. We've undermined that completely, and we have to return to that. But now, you know, our, our cycle, our new cycle is so insane, it's not four-year cycles we think in, it's four-hour cycles, yeah, as opposed to 50 years. So, you know, we, we need some, um, some new blood in our leadership cadres. Next question. Sir, and then we'll come to the front. Let's go over here. Perhaps a bit naive, but uh, in your opinion, why is the United States so incredibly involved in the Mideast? We keep giving money to these various countries. We keep giving weapons to these various countries. And a few years later, they're used against us. What is, what is our purpose? Why are we so involved? Uh, I can give you the three hour or the 30 hour answer to that one. <laughs> um, n n n numerous reasons. Uh, number one is that, that you know, uh, rem we have to remember America is the only country ever, ever, to be created based upon an idea. Not an ethnicity, not a language, not some kind of dynasty, but founded on an idea. Individual liberty and rights for all. We are truly unique in that respect. And as a result, it is easy for us to fall into the belief that, you know, other people deserve to share some of that. And I'm not talking about missionary zeal. I'm talking about making sure 14-year-old Egyptian girls aren't mutilated. That kind of thing, yeah? So I think there, there, there's that idea that we really do represent universal values. And if we can, we'd like to have as many people share in those universal values. But then there's all kinds of things. I mean, you know, I, I'm not an advocate of conspiracy theories, but the fact is, you know, everybody in this country likes their SUVs. If you like your SUV and your 5.7 liter engine, you're going to have to get your gasoline from somewhere. So you know, there's oil as well, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a factor. 
uh, there's other issues as well. There's, you know, we see one nation in that part of the world that functions as a democracy. One nation. And we think it would be not good for anybody if that one nation ceased to exist. So there's all kinds of reasons. Some of them are good. Some of them are less good. I had another question up here. Thank you. Um, my statistics may be off somewhat, but I read recent or saw a video recently where it takes 2.1 uh, children per family Correct. to uh, to reproduce to, to maintain to reproduce, stable population. Maintain. Yeah, and that in Europe it's now <laughs> about 1.6. Right. But regardless of genital mutilation, the Muslims are reproducing at the rate of about 8.1. Sure. Now, you, you talk about long views, 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, in the year 2050, they predict that Europe will certainly be right. a Muslim area. Right. Uh, what can you do about it? Yeah, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> I came here and became an American, right? Uh, yeah, y Europe has some problems. I mean, and the Catholics are the worst of the bunch. They are literally, you know, the lowest reproductive rates in all of Europe. This is a huge problem. Um, there are now, there are now, and please don't take my word for it, check it for yourself, 622 Sharia no-go areas in France. What does that mean? There are 622 districts in the Republic of France where a French policeman cannot enter unless the local imam has invited him. Right? So, you know, the writing's on the wall. The writing's on the wall. What will happen? You have to, the only way you can deal with that is you have to control immigration, and secondly, you have to have an, a, a national identity that can create some kind of unity. And most of Europe has destroyed that in the last 20 years. Uh, when I, I, go, I don't go back to England anymore because I don't recognize the country I grew up in. When I was a child uh, under Margaret Thatcher, the word British was a good word. It meant good things. Today it is pejorative. You do not use the word British because it is associated with the white man exploiting the brown man. Right? Today you are English, Welsh, Irish, Punjabi, Hindi, whatever you want to be, but definitely not British. If you so denude an, a nation of its core identity, you get things like the 7-7 subway bombings. When you have young men, you know, relatively successful young men growing up in England as Muslims who are told that British has no content, Brit British is bad, and they're searching for identity and somebody at the local mosque will fill that vessel with identity. Yeah? So um, what can be done? Not a lot. Um, there is of course one answer, and it's a, a very, very frightening one. There's a, there's a wonderful writer, you may not be familiar with him, Ralph Peters. Ralph Peters is a former military intelligence officer in the US Army. He writes wonderful essays on national security across the breadth of topics. Also, an excellent uh, fictional writer, especially on the Civil War. Ralph Peters, in one of his most provocative essays, wrote the following. I don't really have, um, I don't worry much about Europe and, and the demographics that you're describing, because if there's one thing the Europeans have proven to the world in the 20th century, it's that they're good at genocide. <laughs> right? Now, he's factually correct, but we don't want that to happen. We don't want the response to 600 Sharia no-go areas to be civil war. But if you don't step up to the plate and display some leadership and provide positive content to the identity of what it means to be French, to be uh, German, to be British, then you will constantly be open to that threat of violence, whether it's jihadi violence or whether it's fascist violence. These things are not dead. I, you know, to the young officers I teach and students, I always you know, try to remind them that 1945, in historic terms, was yesterday. Yesterday. The idea that Europe will maintain its peaceful harmony and coexistence just because, you know, bureaucrats in Brussels deem it necessary, it's not factually sound argument. You know, World War II, in historic terms, 
was literally a blink of an eye away. Let's try and make sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, there was a question over here, sir. Yeah. Just hold it real close. When you were mentioning about uh, France, 600 and some districts where the policemen yep. can't go in, it brought to mind that the, uh, it, it, it's rather curious to me, and I'd like you to explain your thinking on why France, among all nations, recognizing that Mali was a former French protectorate and part of the French Empire. Uh, I'd like your viewpoint on why France felt it compelled to get down to Mali to get rid of the bad guys. Yeah and where right. that's uh, situated right now, and quite frankly, what your viewpoint is about these monolithic efforts, U.S. included, to go in and use military force to right. get rid of the bad guys. Okay. Um, I'll give you a, an answer in jest, but there's a lot of truth behind it. France is no longer an empire, but nobody told the French that. <laughs> right? If you look at what they've done in the last 30 years in Côte d'Ivoire, what they're doing in Mali. It's because the, the, the French cannot recognize the fact that they're no longer an Im, Im, imperial nation. So when they see a vestigial historic part of the world that's connected to them uh, in certain crisis or distress, they, even a socialist head of state will deploy troops. It's quite remarkable that a socialist will do that. Um, and I think there's a lot of truth to that, to that half joke. Uh, what do I think of military intervention uh, around the world? Um, I had a class this morning, and, and I, I said uh, the same thing I've always said. What we try to do in Iraq and Afghanistan can only be done by imperial nations. To go in and use foreign troops, our troops, to recreate a new political reality can only be done if you're an empire and you say, and you're, you're an emperor, and you say to your people, I'm interested in going to the subcontinent of India, I'm going to establish the Raj, and we're going to be there for 200 years. Right? We're not an empire. It's antithetical to 1776 because we were born in revolution. So what we should be doing in those countries that we deem to be of a national security interest to America is exactly what we did in Colombia and El Salvador. And that's a very different modus of, of functioning. You don't go in there as Americans to stabilize a country. You go in there to teach the Colombians how to do it. You go in there to teach the El Salvadorian army how to do it. It's not counterinsurgency. It's what technically is called foreign internal defense. Train the trainers. Because you cannot win a counterinsurgency campaign unless you are an empire and you're prepared to stay there for 50 years. And we won't stay there. We won't. There's a fascinating study of how the American population, whether it's Indochina or, or, or Pakistan or Afghanistan, the American population almost to the day loses interest in foreign wars of that nature after six years. It's like, a, it's like a magic number. We get to six years and the electorate says, okay, time to bring the boys home. Yeah? It's, we're, we're not the British Raj. We're not the French in Africa. So there are ways to do this if we deem it important, but it's not us being the fighters. It's assisting the domestic forces. Okay, last question. Any more? Any more? Right down here in the front. There are two great areas that that have large Islamic populations which are not mentioned, one being China mm -hmm. and the other being India. Mm -hmm. uh, Indonesia, of course, is, is the biggest. 100%. But what, what about the... Um, what about the political effort to bring back a caliphate? Mm -hmm. And the caliphate was in Europe, Not basically. Just. Basically, what was known as Europe. Mm -hmm. What What about India and China? In in uh, India and China, they're, they're two very different problems. Uh, in India, if you just look at the numbers and you look at the loss of Pakistan and Bangladesh afterwards, 
the internal threat to India isn't one of caliphate. The issue there is uh, Kashmir and will remain Kashmir. Who has sovereignty over Kashmir, India or Pakistan? And that will be enough of a problem uh, to be getting on with. With China, <laughs> we don't even know how many Muslims there are in China because the Chinese authorities always fudge the issue and the, interestingly the fudge always goes down rather than up. But yes, there is an issue and the Uyghur minority has been well, maltreated. It's like the Chechens in uh, the Russian Federation. Whether or not they could be used as a proto-caliphate, the numbers don't hold. You, you, can't, create, you can't create a Taliban-like separatist movement in China or India, anything close to what existed in Afghanistan in the 1990s. So the, the, the caliphate right now, in my estimation, is being re-established in North Africa and the Middle East. Which is interesting because, as you said, I mean, that's not historically where it's been because it's either been in Damascus and Mecca to begin with, but for most of its recent history, it was in Anatolia and, and Europe, Asia Minor. So, you know, th these are all things that we would profit well from opening our history books again and reminding ourselves uh, what lessons we've forgotten from the past. But one thing is for sure, there are many people who remember the caliphate very, very fondly. Thank you, and uh, please uh, help yourselves. <laughs>